Hello, my name is Tom Wolliver. I'm a professor in the Department of Nutritional Sciences uh, on the medical staff at St. Michael's Hospital and own and operate a contract research organization called GI Labs. I'm here uh, to talk to you about the glycemic index, which was something that was I helped develop while I was a medical student at Oxford University. Uh, we, the impetus for thinking about the glycemic index came from a desire to improve the glycemic, the dietary management of diabetes. And for nearly a century, uh, meal planning in diabetes has been uh, associated or planned around carbohydrate counting. So the dietitian will review the person's diet record and will prescribe a certain number of exchanges of carbohydrate for every meal. And these exchanges in Canada contain 15 grams of carbohydrate. And the concept or the implication is that 15 grams of carbohydrate from different foods will have the same effect on uh, the metabolism of the body. And that was a question we wanted to ask. Would an equivalent amount of carbohydrate from different foods have the same effect on blood glucose or not? Now, around about the mid-1970s, uh, people had been finding that, in fact, different foods did elicit different glycemic responses. This is an early study from uh, Jerry Reven's group. Uh, Jerry Reven is uh, famous for developing the insulin resistance concept and the metabolic syndrome. And they showed that uh, potato, for example, in this slide, uh, elicited a similar response to uh, glucose, whereas corn and bread were somewhat lower. Ironically, although they were some of the first to describe these differences, uh, they became some of the largest critics of the GI concept. Now, we weren't aware of this work when we got into the GI. We moved into it because we had been studying the effect of fiber, dietary fiber, on glucose responses, and we found that the ability of uh, purified fibers to reduce glucose uh, was related to a viscosity. And so we wondered what would be the impact of uh, of foods containing viscous fibers, such as oats and legumes, as compared to non-viscous fibers, such as wheat bran, on glucose responses. And some technological advances had recently been made, which made studying a large number of foods feasible for us. One of them was the development of an automatic glucose analyzer, which could analyze blood glucose uh, on just 25 microliters of blood. And the other was the invention of the world's first uh, modern version of the capillary blood sampling system, which was made just a few miles up the road from us in Oxford. And we had some of the earliest uh, samples of this, this equipment. So we wanted to study a lot of foods, and uh, we had a number of problems to overcome. And one of them was, how could we control for being unable to test all of the foods we wanted to test in the same group of subjects. We could never test 60 foods in the same people. And so the way we thought we could get around that was to give everybody 50 grams of glucose and express their food response as a percentage of the glucose response. We used 50 grams because that was the diagnostic test for diabetes at the time in England. Uh, we also were concerned that people's responses wouldn't change over the time of the study that we had. And so uh, we repeated the glucose test at various intervals, and we decided to use the average of all the, the, the tests in each subject in the calculation. Uh, finally, we had to figure out how we could calculate or express the area under the curve. What we wanted was to find out what the area under the curve above the fasting level, which is illustrated in the gray shading here. And uh, we thought about perhaps we could draw this on graph paper and count the squares. <laughs> that didn't work because the blinds go through the squares. Then we thought, well, maybe we could cut out the graph and weigh it. And well, that, that was really seemed impractical. And as I reflected on this, I suddenly realized that you know, we could break this curve up into a series of trapezoids and use our elementary uh, geometry from high school to calculate the area under the curve using the trapezoid rule, and we could simplify this down to a, an equation in the bottom there, which is pretty simple. But the problem with that was, what happened when the blood glucose undershot the baseline, as shown in the tan area here? We only wanted to calculate 
the gray, but if we use the trapezoid rule, we'd end up subtracting the tan area from the gray. And in this case, that would make about a 25% difference in the result. So uh, what we had to do, I had to do, figure out how do we calculate the area of that little segment, which went down to figuring out how do we find out what T prime is. And I realized, of course, that T prime over T equals D over D plus E. And so we could then uh, work that out. Now this area calculation is rather important uh, in determining GI. And in a study we did with 28 labs around the world, an interlab study, I found that more than 50% of the labs actually reported incorrect AUC values. And so when you're reading the literature, it's sometimes rather difficult to know whether the areas have been calculated correctly. I find this rather surprising uh, since you know, glucose responses are relatively elementary things to be studying. Uh, anyway, moving along, we didn't have computers in those days and we used uh, sheets like this to record our data. And so in 1981, we published these results for 62 foods. And you can see right away that there's about a fourfold range of responses to uh, equal amounts of carbohydrate in different foods. And the differences are very large, not only between the food groups, but within the food groups. So this suggested to us that this concept was important in terms of uh, diabetes management. It might be useful. We immediately, though, drew criticisms, and these came from the Reven group. Uh, it was the GI different in different people, doesn't apply in meals, and we actually don't think it's going to have any utility to improve glycemic control. So we've done several studies to look to see whether it does differ in different people. Uh, glucose responses vary tremendously from day to day within subjects, and this is a source of large variation. Uh, this is the latest study, the most recent study we did, where we looked at the GI and the area of the curve for five carbohydrate foods in normal subjects, insulin-resistant subjects, and people with type 2 diabetes. And there's a tenfold range of glycemic responses, AUC. Uh, but the black circles represent the GI values in the, in the mean of the five foods in each person. And you can see these don't vary very much. And up in the uh, top left corner of the graph, we see that how the variation is partitioned using analysis of variance. Most of the variation, the white bar is the, the area is between subjects. And the effect of expressing it as GI, in fact, reduces this variation between subjects to virtually zero, to be non-significant. So in fact, this does normalize uh, responses between people and the value does not differ. There's certainly variation. This is due to day-to-day -day variation within subjects, and that tells us how many people we ought to be able to use or should use to get an accurate result. Does it apply in mixed meals? And Jerry Reven did a study in 1984 where they uh, looked at the responses to potato, rice, and spaghetti in a mixed meal, and all the meals contained the same amount of protein, fat, and carbohydrate, and they showed that their interpretation was the GI values of the foods varied over a two-fold range. The glucose responses varied by only a very small amount. And they concluded that the results are totally disparate from what would have been predicted by the GI. So when I looked at that, those uh, results, we published a paper to, to demonstrate how to use calculate a mixed meal, GI. And we thought they had done some inappropriate assessment. First, they'd done total versus incremental area. These are their data. The total area under the curve goes down to zero. The increment is only that above the red line, and that shows the differences between foods relatively are much greater. That is what the GI is based on. So we need to compare uh, the same type of calculation. And when we do that, you see the areas are uh, relative differences are much bigger. We also uh, felt that Coulston et al. did not account for the carbohydrate which was present in every meal from bread. A third of the carbohydrate was the same in every meal. And I thought they used the wrong value for potato. I showed you earlier how they found that potato in their hands gave a glycemic response the same as glucose. Coulston used a value of 77, which we'd published from England. I felt they should use 135, which they had found, and then uh, when we take account of the bread, that reduces the differences a little between uh, for the meal. And I found that, in fact, the meal GI was virtually perfectly associated with the AUC. 
So this, I think, has a lot of implications, important implications beyond GI. I mean, it shows that different people can look at exactly the same data and draw opposite conclusions from it. So I think you need to keep that in mind as you assess the literature. However, Reven's criticisms were useful to us, and we began thinking about, well, how do we account for differences in carbohydrate? And we did some dose response curves and developed an equation to express the glucose response relative to glucose as a function of GI and grams of carbohydrate. And that, that, that equation and the data are shown there, it fits very well. We then tested this uh, in collaboration with Jenny Brand Miller in Sydney with 13 commonly consumed breakfast test meals, which varied in energy, fat, protein, large variation carbohydrate and glycemic index. And again, we found almost a perfect correlation between the calculated relative response and the actual mean area under the curve. So this demonstrated that carbo GI was a determinant of the response, but these are sort of artificial meals. So we, we then went on to say what happens in people eating whatever they want. So this was a study we looked at abdominally obese adults wearing a continuous glucose monitor, eating whatever they want, recording their breakfast intake, or in fact, their whole intake. The breakfast response, 30% of that was explained by the GI, about 11% by the uh, oral glucose tolerance test result, another 11% by the amount of carbohydrate, and a small amount by the waist circumference. So we could explain over 50% of the response uh, by those factors. So this clearly showed GI is a determinant of glucose responses in mixed meals. So it's not really surprising that exchanging high GI foods for low GI foods is clinically relevant in diabetes and improves glycemic control. And this is the most recent meta-analysis showing a significant improvement in glycemic control uh, with low GI diet. I was not involved in this analysis at all. But it, GI has relevance to not just diabetes, but research has shown it has relevance to everybody. Uh, this is a most recent uh, analysis of uh, the Harvard group's prospective studies showing that uh, high GI diet increases the risk for developing type 2 diabetes. Uh, carbohydrate, it's not widely appreciated. The amount of carbohydrate really has no impact. And so glycemic load, which is the GI times the carbohydrate, has very little effect. It's not just diabetes, which uh, the health implications of GI. There are clinical trial data, and the evidence is color-coded uh, quality green, uh, ye yellow, and blue. It's excellent evidence that GI can, is useful for weight management, both increased weight reduction and reduced weight regain. Some evidence it's good for your social life by uh, reducing the severity of acne, improves physical and mental performance, affects pregnancy outcomes, reduce autoposity of the infants born. There's also evidence from prospective studies, not only for reduced risk of diabetes, but also for heart disease, for inflammatory uh, diseases, um, macular degeneration, cancer, and a number of other conditions as well. So this is relevant to everybody. So how do we apply uh, GI? And this is where I think we're, we're just beginning to move. Uh, health professionals need educating. Only about half of dietitians in Canada use the GI in managing diabetes. Uh, and uh, many health professionals don't understand the concept. And the Dietitians of Canada, um, one of my ex-PhD students, Shannon Grant, is working on a program which, with the Dietitians of Canada, which will be online, to educate health professionals about GI. We need to think of GI not as uh, a measure of how healthy a food is for you. It's a measure of carbohydrate quality. We don't forget everything else we know about nutrition. But there are various markers of carbohydrate quality, including glycemic index, fiber, and whole grain, which can be used to assess the quality of our carbohydrate. And the application is very simple. We simply exchange a higher GI food for a lower one. So at breakfast, in, you know, instead of having cornflakes, you could have oatmeal. Dinner, you can have pasta instead of mashed potato. If you're having a barbecue, you'd have cold potato salad instead of hot baked potato. If you're having a snack, yogurt and fruit instead of cheese and crackers, for example. We also, people need to 
be able to find out what the GI values of foods are. These, and so in order to do that, they need to be on the food label. And so we need regulatory approval. And in terms of that, we need an accurate and precise method of measuring GI. And it's not really widely appreciated, but the International Standard Organization has a method published in 2010, which is in fact accurate and precise enough to meet the standards for food labeling in Canada. We need to certify the proficiency of labs in measuring GI. This varies widely and uh, the, is a program being developed by the GI Symbol Program in Australia. Um, we need to work on this in Canada. And we also have now Health Canada has agreed to work with the Canadian Diabetes Association to develop a system for GI labeling so that consumers and health professionals can know what the GI values of the foods in their supermarkets are. So if I can summarize what I have to say about glycemic index, I can summarize this in five words. This is a concept which is relevant to everybody and it should be applied every day at every meal. Thank you very much.